Cedric. How much love I had for him when he was born and all the hope <laughs> I had for him. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Welcome everybody to Still a Part of Us. We are so excited to talk to Stephanie today. I'm looking so forward to this discussion that we're going to have because I think it's going to help a lot of people. Um, so welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us about um, Cedric and, and your family and and what you've gone through. And it's been a lot. I'm excited to, like I said, get into this a little bit more. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. So Stephanie, tell me a little bit about your family and um, especially like what did your family look like at the time that Cedric was born? Yeah, so I had um, a little girl. Uh, she was at the time three and a half. Okay. Um, she was actually born with um, symmetrical IUGR, oh, okay. which is really rare because usually they're if if they're smaller, there's something called head, uh, brain sparing that happens where the head is normal size but the body is small. Okay. But in twenty percent. Everything is small, and that's usually genetic. Okay. So, and Tom, can you define what the the symmetrical um, IUGR, IUGR, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. So, intrauterine growth restriction mm -hmm. um, basically happens. I'm, I'm not sure of every single reason why it happens. Mm -hmm. I just know that in my case, they had no idea, but they were leaning towards a genetic factor oh. where um, all the whole baby was small. So she was born at 40 weeks, but she measured like a 34-week-old baby. Oh, um, so really tiny. Uh, how yeah. how big was she at the time? She was two kilogram, which okay. um, in my head, if I'm doing the conversion into pounds, I feel like it's like, 4.9 pounds or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so she was tiny and she was um, in critical condition when she was born. So she had stopped moving and I was in full labor, but I wasn't dilating or anything. Oh, okay. So they really induced me quickly to get her out as soon as possible. And then um, I was like right next to the NICU when she was born and they brought like, her there. Great. Okay. Yeah, but she was, we were really lucky. We were in the 33% of families that didn't have any long-term consequences. She Great. she had like a catch-up growth and everything was fine. Okay. Uh, we didn't have any follow-ups or anything like that. And so I waited, you know, a fair while before trying to have another baby. Mm -hmm. um, so we started in September, 2021. Okay. And um, so there's my husband, there's me, and my daughter, uh -huh. my, my eldest daughter, Annabelle. Awesome. And um, we tried, and I had a miscarriage at six weeks, so my first my first try. Okay. And then, and so then I guys, got pregnant. You were actively trying to get pregnant and were hoping to plan for this, uh, another child then, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, we were. And, you know, I was, I never had trouble getting pregnant. That mm -hmm. was, I, was I, I don't want to say you're quite fertile because you, you never really know until you like, yeah, get tested for everything. And, yeah. <laughs> but I never had a problem getting pregnant. So, but then I seemed to develop a problem of keeping my pregnancies. So, mm -hmm. I miscarried, then I waited a cycle, and then I got pregnant with Cedric. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because the, I remember those first, like, um, three months, I was, like, so nervous of losing him again. 
Yeah. And I went in at nine weeks to see my OB and uh, they were just like, um, so your last pregnancy was fine because in because I'm located in Canada. So Mm -hmm. we don't have like a follow up where your OB like we do have a postpartum follow up, but it wasn't with the same OB that followed my pregnancy. So she didn't know about the IEGR. Okay. So she was just like, yeah, your last pregnancy was fine. I see you gave birth at 40 weeks. And I was like, actually, no, <laughs> like Annabelle had a symmetrical IEGR, okay. blah, blah, blah. And uh, so she was like, oh, so she prescribed me the fo- the high folic acid, which is like five milligrams okay. instead of one. one. I was taking the one and okay. I did take the one before trying to get pregnant, like a few months. And uh, so she put me on the five milligram and she uh, gave me some 80 milligram aspirin, like the baby aspirin, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the full dose. It was like one pill instead of two. Yeah. Okay. And we we started at nine weeks and then I started feeling like very pregnant again because I had like, I felt very pregnant and then it sort of like dwindled and then it went back up. Oh, interesting. Yeah, after I I took the aspirin, that really made a difference. And then, yeah, so I was on my merry way and I did the 12 week ultrasound and he was sort of in a funny position. And so the tech couldn't really get a good image of him. Yeah. So they asked the OB to come in and she just like, I want to say she flipped her wand. Like they said, she just looked at him with the wand reverse. Oh. Okay. It's something like some technical. Yeah. And she's like, your baby looks fine. And I remember the tech going, what about the heart? And the OB was like, no, 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 he's fine. That's a beautiful baby. You're very lucky. Have a good day. Hmm. So I was like, okay. Okay. And so that was at 12 weeks. So you had an ultrasound at 12 weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just looking at it, it's it's not the anatomy scan. That's not usually when they um, at twelve weeks in Canada they do like uh, yeah the anatomy. They do. Um, it's mostly for like make sure they don't have Down syndrome. Okay. Or so they looking... look at their spinal cord, yeah, like okay. if there's no like major defect or problem. Okay. 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 So at 12 weeks, that's when they're looking at some of the, maybe the genetic things. And you didn't do any sort of like genetic testing ahead of time or anything either? No. Um, I know. The, you, that, you technically, I, I, yeah, I don't think you have any reason to. I just, as uh, some people no, do no, and some people don't. So. because my husband does have a cleft lip uh, on both sides. Oh, okay. And, um, but it it's mostly... Um, it's mostly men and it's, it skips two generation. It comes back before it comes back. Okay. But I had spoken to my doctor and she's like, you know, even if you could have all the answers, I don't think you want to know. So I was like, okay. Okay. So we were on our merry way. And then, um, I remember I did the down syndrome testing the first part. Cause I just like, at 12 weeks, you have a blood test, and then you go back at 16 weeks for another blood test or okay. something like that. Okay. And uh, I remember around 15 weeks, was it? Sorry, I took notes because also <laughs> I would forget. Which is good. It's good. <laughs> so at 15 weeks, I got some really bad gastro. Like, I was like, had a 24-hour flu. I was like, oh, it was really, really bad. And I was nervous for the baby because I knew how it could be dangerous, maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, mid of that week, so 15 weeks and four days, mm-hmm. Annabelle put her her elbow on my belly and she pushed to like get up. Get up. Uh-huh. And it was like right like on where the baby would be. And so I remember I went to the OB like the day after. And I was like, this happened and I had gastro. I want to make sure the baby's okay. And she had the Doppler on. And I remember the intern again goes like, oh, what about the heartbeat? And the doctor's like, no, no, no. The heartbeat's fine. Everything's fine. So we knew that at 15 weeks and a half, he had a heartbeat and he was alive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, and then, yeah, everything was fine. 
uh, we went on for another three weeks. Okay. Were and you feeling? Were you feeling okay? Like, well, I wasn't sickness? feeling as. It's funny you say that because around early eighteen weeks, I was like, "Gee, like this bra didn't fit me before, and now it fits me." And I did. I, it was just a small thought went through my head, and I didn't. I didn't pay attention to it. I just thought, "Oh, you know." Good, good thing. One more bra that fits, right? Like, you yeah. didn't really think about it. But now that I look back on it, I was like, okay, I was I was losing pregnancy symptoms. I wasn't feeling as nauseous. And I remember the day I um, started bleeding and losing fluids. Uh-huh. I woke up in my sleep and I was sleeping on my stomach. And I, when I'm pregnant, I never do that. I, yeah. For some reason, it's like instinctual. And so I was like, okay. And I remember waking up at 3 a.m. So we're at 18 weeks and four or five days, something like that. And uh, I remember waking up. I was like, I'm really wet. I think I peed myself. And so mm. I wake up at 3 a.m. I go to the bathroom and I'm like just covered in like blood and amniotic oh. fluid. Yeah. And I I was like in denial. I was like, I think I'm losing the baby. But, she, but I was like, you know, trying to be positive. And I was like, it, maybe I'm just spotting. Maybe, you know, maybe this A is lot benign and it's yeah. all right. But like deep down inside of me, I was losing my baby. And so I woke up. I couldn't fall back to sleep then. And I called my friend. I was like, do you think she go to the ER? Like, I think that's going to be okay. And, uh, and everybody was like, yeah, you need to go to the ER. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I waited till 8 a.m. And at 8 a.m., I called my OB. And I was like, I'm having some bleeding. Should I come in or should I go to the ER? And they're like, no, you have to go to the ER. I'm like, okay. So I go to the ER. It's like 8.30. And I go to triage. Mm -hmm. And it was, we still had some like over here in Canada, we still had a lot of like uh, backlog in the hospitals because of COVID. Because of COVID. Yes. And so once again, it's uh, September 2021, right? Uh, Now, now we're March 30th of 2022. 22. Okay. So Our, still have some, I'm sure there's still plenty of either restrictions or like the other things that are causing yeah. hospitals to be kind of a little weird, actually. Actually, sorry, we're March 29th. Yeah. So March 29th, okay. 2022. And um, the nurses are like, you know, they're exhausted and there's yeah. they're short staff. And yeah. I got this nurse and I'm sure she was absolutely exhausted, but she just looked at me and she's like you shouldn't be here and I I was just like and you know I'm so seriously I'm such a like conscious person about people being overworked and like I like I really don't want to like pressure the system more than it, it needs yeah. to you know so I, when she told me that I was like like taking it back and I was like well I called my OB and they referred me here and she's like you shouldn't be here you should go to the maternity ward but I was like they don't take patients under 20 weeks and so she called me to any ward and they were like, no, you have to leave her in the ER. And then <sighs> she starts examining me and she's like, she's like, you just had a little bit of spotting. She's like, you shouldn't be here taking up resources like that. It's because of people like you that the ER is always full. And I was like, <sighs> I, had, I, I had got all this emotion. And I got like, really like, like I was really sad and yeah. And then I started like then and then she started saying like, well, OK, then I'm just going to clear my OB room for you and you're going to be the first patient in and like being super passive aggressive. Wow. And and so she returned me to the waiting room and I was having contractions, which at the time I didn't know were contractions because my only experience of contraction were at a 40 week baby, not an 18 week. Yeah. So they were a lot lighter and it yeah. just felt like a little bit of cramping. Yeah. Um, and so I remember going back there and thinking to myself, well, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't be here. And so I waited there until 
1 p.m. And then I said, you know what? Oh, I didn't that's... have any more cramping, uh-huh. which is good. It's not, it's, <laughs> I know in, in the States, it's, it's quite long, but in Canada, like it's, that wouldn't be considered too long. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and well, one and, and I was like, were you there by yourself too? Was your husband with you? So my or... husband was with Annabelle. Oh, that's and right. That's I was right. there um, alone. Okay. Up to that point. And then, okay. And then um, at one, I was like, maybe this nurse is right. You know, I should just go home. I don't have any more cramping. I haven't bled more. I think I'm going to be fine. I should just head home. And then I called my mom and my mom was like, no, 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 you need to stay there. Like you've waited all this time. Like, don't lose your spot. She's like, I'm going to come over and sit with you. So I was like, okay, I'm going to wait another hour. So, I, and then at 2 PM, they called me into a room. Okay. And I waited another two, three hours, two, two or three hours. Okay. And um, then the, the, attending came in he's like the trauma attending Mm -hmm. and he just come in and he's like okay your baby's dead it's not (gasps) looking good like just like that and I'm literally winter I was just like uh okay wait and wait wait how did they get any sort of how was he he able to he didn't know he just saw I had spotting at 18 weeks and he was just like your baby's dead and so he had this nurse come in and hold my hand while he did the echo. And it took about 10 seconds. And he was like, look, there's no heartbeat. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna switch you to the maternity ward. Oh. So he leaves. And I'm just so, I have this denial. And I kept remembering the five symptoms of grief. And I was like, I'm in denial. I'm in denial. Like this, this, I'm 18 weeks. This can't be happening. I'm like, like this doesn't happen to I'm not I'm not gonna lose it at 18 weeks. Like yeah. what is this? I was I was like, I'm sure the OB is gonna come here. There's gonna be some sort of like technicality and this baby's gonna be okay. Yeah. Like in my head as like yeah. <laughs> like literally my train of yep. thought, which is yep. now that I think about it, like complete denial. Yeah. And um and then uh, the resident OB came, she did the ultrasound and she too was like, there's no more heartbeat. I'm really sorry. And I started like being like, no, no, the attending OB is going to say it's okay. And I kept like telling myself that, but I told the resident, I was just like, I voiced, okay, what are my options? And she goes like, you could schedule a DNE, but you'd have to keep the baby for a week while they had time to take you in or we can give you misoprostol and uh, induced labor and you could give birth to him tonight so I was like okay I want to give birth to him vaginally and you know that's that's going to be that right and um and at that time was your mom still with you or had she gone home yeah so at that time my mom was still there and I remember calling my husband and saying the baby's dead and I was just like just no emotion just like I just couldn't believe I was calling him to say that like the baby's dead and I remember he was like this is a joke right it's not funny and I was like no Mike I like the baby's dead like you have to come I'm gonna give birth tonight yeah and he's like taking it back and like uh, oh okay so yeah my dad watched Annabelle and my mom drove home and he drove to the hospital so I was left alone for like I don't know like 45 minutes okay wasn't that bad and um I remember calling my in-law and just breaking down like the baby said I can't believe this is happening to me yeah so then they were like okay go for go and eat something and then come back in an hour. And we came back and they gave us a room like far back. Yeah. And um, in the, on the maternity ward by this time? Yeah. Okay. And I didn't know who was the on-call OB. Yeah. Like I didn't. But it turned out that it was my OB that followed me um, throughout my pregnancy. And she was like, I'm so sorry this is happening. And in my head, I'm like, you do another ultrasound. Like I'm sure you're going to 
he's going to be alive. Check, <laughs> check it out again, please. Yeah. So they did another ultrasound and, and there was no heartbeat. And I just I broke down and started crying. Couldn't believe this was happening to me. And um, they started like me on my soprostol and I slept there. Nothing much was happening. I wasn't bleeding or anything. Yeah. And then um, I woke up around eight and then around nine, I started having like significant contractions. And then um, they, I had a, like, they checked my dial, dilation oh, and they were mm-hmm. like, okay, you're four. And I just like, I remember, like, I did not want to feel this pain. Like, not at all. Like, I, I was like, I want an epidural. I mean, the pain wasn't that bad. Like, no, no, now I look back on it, but I, I, I didn't want to feel yeah. myself giving birth to my dead baby. Yeah. And so I got, but then again, we're on the remnants of COVID and they ran out of tubing for me for oh. the epidural. Yeah. And they, they didn't have the one that's the catheter. That's like uh, that, the, that little flimsy, flimsy catheter that goes down. Yeah. Yeah. They had the hard one. Oh. So I felt like they were sticking me with a fondue stick in my, yeah, it was horrible. I mean, I think I am, I was more traumatized about that epidural than the birth. Like it was like, I had numbness in my left leg for months afterwards. Um, oh just my gosh. Absolutely. It was like horrible. And then to top it off, like, Five minutes after the epidural, the baby was like crowning and coming out. Oh, of course. Yeah. And um, the anesthet, the the guy that did the epidural was just like, what's your name? How are you? <laughs> I remember I had my hair all over me and I was crying. And I was like, I don't want to talk to you. Like, yeah. it's like, read the f- chart. Like, yeah. I'm losing my baby. I don't want to say like, yeah. oh, yeah, I'm doing great, sir. Like, yeah. It's not his fault, like, because uh, yeah. the hospital where we go is, uh, like, a teaching hospital. Yeah. So he's not an attending. He was a resident. Right. So obviously he's still he's, learning. And yep. <laughs> so yes. it's, it's, like, it's not his fault. Yeah. But I was just, like, you I'd know. Be, yeah. Yes. Please look at my chart before you come in here because not everything and not every epidural for a pregnancy is going to end well. So, yeah. Yeah. So anyway... I ended up starting, they put me into position and then they were like, okay, what, just don't push yet. And I just started crying. I was like, I can't believe that I'm giving birth to my dead baby. And it's just, is it just, all the emotion came out, started bawling. And then the baby like half came out. Yeah. And then she was like, okay, well, don't show us. You got to push. And I pushed and, you know, I gave birth, they put him on my chest. And I remember while I was waiting for the misoprostol to work it, work itself out. They kept telling me, have you thought if you want to hold your baby? Yeah. What's going to be his name? And those were things that like, I had no idea. Like I, it's just, I, you know, never thought of I never heard anybody speak of that yeah and it's so funny that's another reason why I really wanted to come on here was because I had read this article and like this girl from BC that had a medical abortion because there was too many damages to her baby like he just couldn't survive and she was 22 weeks and she opted for a DNC and I remember reading in the article how she woke up from her DNC and she was like, where's my baby? I want to, I want to see my baby. And they just had disposed of the baby. Yeah. And so that's why I was so relieved that my hospital, you know, really said you should give birth. You should hold your baby. They really, and if it wasn't for them, I, I don't think I would have done, done it, you know, um, yeah. because I was really nervous at 18 weeks. I was like, what's he going to look like? you know yeah totally but once they put him on me it was for me it was like if he was 40 weeks I it was my baby I I held him I was crying and it was like 
it was a lot, but I'm so glad I did because yeah. um, I'm never going to get those moments back, you know, and it made the whole thing real. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we held him and then um, we put him, then they told me it was a boy. Then I was like, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, they put him aside. About 10 minutes later, they were like, do you have a funeral home? 10 minutes later, they were like, do you have a funeral? I was like, lady, like I'm, first of all, I was having like the itches. I, I never had oh. that from an epidural, I, the itches. And yeah. I was like, Mm -hmm. my BP was was dangerously low it was like really low and then um and so I was like sort of passing out and they were like do you have a funeral home I was like lady like I'm I'm give wiped me, here like yeah, give I, me a second <laughs> like can you give me like two or three hours maybe <laughs> like and she's like okay I'm gonna come back but this is urgent I was like okay and I really wanted to do acclimation. I did because it's like more environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. So it was like finding a place that did acclimation. And okay, wait, like, I actually don't know what acclimation is. Tell me what acclimation is. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you can either like cremation is like when you like you you, you yeah. just burn and get the uh -huh. ashes. But then acclimation is just like you put them in water that boils. Okay. And then you have like um you have ashes afterwards but the, just the process is more eco-friendly oh okay yeah and in my area it's quite rare so okay. but I found this place and the guy was so nice and he was so understanding and because they were so small they, they don't charge you it's like free um, so um kind. but then they came in and they were like do you want genetic testing? And I was like, yes, please sign okay. me up. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, yeah you're I like, know obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And so they organized all of that. They took the baby away. Oh, wait, Stephanie, I'm going to ask a couple of questions really fast. Yeah. 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 How big was Cedric? <sighs> he was 63 grams. 63 grams. Oh, so little. Yeah. It was. So then. The geneticist came in to talk to us uh -huh. and she was just like, I looked at Cedric and I feel like he was dead for two weeks. So he would have been dead around 16 weeks. Okay. What is your mind thinking? Because that's kind of happening. That's occurring around when you had um, some sort of maybe GI issue. Yeah, I had um, that a week before. Yeah. And I just, I didn't, I had, I didn't know because I didn't know if he was like IUGR, like Annabelle. Right. Okay. And that's why he was so small. Yeah. Or if he was really dead two weeks before. Like, I just, I had no idea. And the worst part is, was that around 15 weeks, I had started to feel him move. Yeah. And then it stopped. And then, so I just, it. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. It was it was really upsetting to me to know that my baby had been had passed inside of me for that long. Yeah. And that I missed it. So technically they call it a missed late miscarriage. A late miscarriage. Yeah. And um they discharged me. I went home the same day. But they had held on to my my, my my med care card like in Canada you have a card and mm -hmm. you just give that and everything's free right so yeah. they had held on to my card and so the next day they call me and they're like we have your card you have to come and get it and I remember my husband drove me there because parking's a nightmare he was just like go and come back and I'll yeah. pick you up yeah and I go up there start crying crying like I was like my dad I have to pick up my baby it's like my Medicare card like I need my baby and and they were just like your baby's gone he's he's gone to autopsy no 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 and um do they do an autopsy for every did you guys request an autopsy I, I'm not yeah. I'm not totally sure what the 
the procedure yeah. is usually. So you did request an autopsy. Okay. When they came for genetic testing, I said, I want an autopsy as okay. well. Okay, perfect. Um, okay. But it's not like, I don't know how it is in the States. Up here, the process is really long, though. You don't get answers for months. They told me six months, but yeah, it ended up being something like eight. Okay. Yeah, um, six months, I think, is pretty typical in the States as well. It takes a long time to process everything. Yeah. And, um, get reports and everything. So yeah. Oh, and I'm going to ask you another question. When you guys were in the hospital with Cedric and you were able to have him like with you guys, um, did you name him then or did you kind of name him before he came? Um, and, and why did you choose the name Cedric? Well, we really were stuck between Felix and Cedric. And um, Both cute names. we really love Felix. Mm -hmm. But then when I gave birth, my husband was like in denial himself and was like, we're going to have another boy. Don't you worry. We're going to call him Felix. So let's call this one Cedric. It's like in Harry Potter. He died too. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Like, yeah, he did I'm, die too. But yeah, <laughs> but Cedric's like, a just, really cute name. Yeah, and it's really important for us. That it's bilingual because obviously our mother tongue is French. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important for us that it's a name that is well spoken in French and English and yeah. other languages. So yeah. Cedric was, it was good. And um, yeah, so I then went on my merry way home, got my card, had a meltdown at the hospital. I want to get my baby back. Yeah. They just gave me my Medicare card. So I went back, went home. And in Canada, you have only seven days to come back for postpartum complications where you don't have to go to the ER. Oh, okay. And then 10 days later, I had cramping again. And um, I evacuated a pretty large portion of placenta. So then I went to the ER again they didn't they uh, um guess i guess no I, they didn't do an ultrasound there to see if everything was out oh okay that is bizarre to me okay okay yeah. so you went to the er 10 days later for yeah. this very reason mm -hmm. oh my gosh i'm like okay. yeah <laughs> so and i'm astonished <laughs> because of everything that had happened my only mechanism was bawling my eyes out being like this can't be happening again like it's just breaking out oh yeah and then luckily because I was like I don't want to wait here like 12 hours to yeah. tell me that part of my dead baby is still inside of me. like I literally say it, said it like that yeah and so they luckily enough they just called the maternity ward and oh. they sent me straight to a room oh good oh good and they came down and they were like you're having placenta uh, retention um, and um, we need to reinduce you for the remaining part. Yeah. So they gave me my sulfrostol. They sent me home. And they're like, when you're laying down, put your my sulfrostol in. And you're just going to give birth again at home. So that was like very... Not fun. Oh, that's like double trauma for me. I would be like, n oh, it's no. not finished. It's okay, okay, okay. There's keep, more coming. Keep, keep going, Stephanie. <laughs> and so then I go home, and I did have a little bit of bleeding, okay. but it stopped quickly, huh. like very quickly. And I had a lot of cramping though. And then um, about ten days later. I go back in because I'm having abdominal, abdominal pain. And they're like, you have an infection. You have a uterus infection. So then they did an ultrasound, finally. And they were like, holy shit, there's still a lot of blood inside. Like, And then they said, you had a failed, so the misoprostol failed to work. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, great, so I'm going to have a DNC now. Like, what's the deal? Yes. And they, I saw the high-risk OB 
And again, for this situation, I had to go to the ER again and cry again and say, this system is broken. Like, why do I, why can't I just go straight to maternity? I'm having serious issues. It's, it's yeah. not a joke. Yeah. And they accepted to see me at the high risk clinic and they, they were like, um, they were like, listen, we don't think a DNC is good, especially if you want to have more kids. There's risks that you're going to have scarring. And yeah. it's maybe unnecessary because if we were in the wild, like you wouldn't have a DNC, you would just let it pass. So they gave me antibiotics. And I then like 10 days later had my period, which okay. was like giving birth again. Because it was very, oh yeah, it was every, it was everything basically coming out then. At that uh, 50%. Okay. but 50%, And then. 50% only? What? Yeah. And then the next cycle, I had the same thing and like had major cramping, like e major. Yeah. Like I thought I had endometriosis. Like I usually don't even take Advil through my period, but this time I was it like was bad. folded into like really bad. And, um, yeah, so basically, yeah, then after that, I thought I was going to be ovulating again. So we, tr but, so I tested, yeah. but I wasn't ovulating. Oh, so okay. until my system started ovulating again and I was back to normal, it took a solid three months, three cycles before it was back to normal. Yeah. I mean, Really? I mean, with the infection as well, did that clear up? Okay. I'm assuming it cleared up. Okay. With the antibiotics. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, um, oh. and it's just, that's just not, you know, talking about all the emotional. Yeah. I know. I know. We're just talking medical here now. I was like, yeah. I, I can imagine you going through this and like breaking down every single time you go to the ER or to the maternity ward and just yeah. like being reminded all over again, every yeah. single time. Like of the trauma that you experienced there yeah. and continuing to experience, it seems like, holy cow. It's like, you know, I remember some, I can't remember what grief podcast it was I was listening to, but this person said, it's like when you lose a child, like a part of you, you lose a part of yourself mm -hmm. and it never goes away, but you are able eventually to cope with it and live with it more you get okay yeah with that I don't but it it's totally that and for those first three months I was I don't want to say I was severely depressed because sometimes I would be perfectly okay but then like three minutes later they completely break down crying yeah and then 10 minutes later be completely okay yeah. it was such a roller coaster of emotions and that first week I came home, I had to have a teddy bear sleep with me because I had this feeling of being completely empty. Yeah. And somehow the teddy bear sort of soothed me and I felt pregnant again. Like it, yeah. it was really, really weird. But I think also very normal too, because I get where you're coming from that there's a like you said feels like there's like a hole in you yeah and Com completely yeah and and there's a part of you that is missing and and it feels like it's never going to get filled it's never going to like you're never going to be right any you're never going to be whole you're never going to be okay you just yeah. that's how you feel you just kind of feel like you're gonna be you're gonna be walking around with a hole in your in your heart <laughs> it's yeah it's a terrible feeling and it's like, t still to this day, they ask me how many kids I have. I was like, I have three kids. Like, it, it's not like I have two kids. And it it's so weird. And it's for so long, you know, you tell people I just lost my baby. And it's like, poof, silence, froze. It's like you shot like an AK-47. Like nobody, like nobody's speaking. They don't know what to tell you. Yep. And usually, like, because when I lost, my first, well, it your wasn't first, my first your, miscarriage, yeah, but yeah. that they were like, well, you know, it's only six weeks. But then when you tell them 18 weeks, they just like, they can't tell you, oh, well, at least it was just that six weeks, you know, at least it's, yep. you know, 
they would, they just don't know. And they, it, I realized how taboo it was to speak about those things. Yeah. Yeah. It was just. Oh. Stephanie, I'm so sorry. I just am like, just astounded by what you have been through. So when I, I actually want to go back to, did you guys end up um, having a little funeral or a, a service or did you just have um, Cedric's so body, the acclimated? The, yeah. So we got the ashes back about three weeks later mm-hmm. and then um, I just held on to them in a Ziploc <laughs> baggie for like a really long time. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, I don't want to make like a big, like, like, I'm not, I'm not like a like tree hugger. Like I, but I, I do want to be conscious of our environment. Yeah. And I was like, wouldn't it be nice to just put his ashes under a tree and let the tree grow. And we have a big farm out here. And so I, I, I got a spot and I put his ashes down and I put a tree and right it's there. a weeping willow. Oh. And it's actually just bloomed completely. It's really nice now, but so he's there. And I remember um, about six months ago, we had an offer to buy the farm, a really, really good offer. And we, my parents accepted it. And I was like, well, my baby's there. Like I felt so like, I felt like I was leaving him behind. And it's just, this whole process made me question I'm not like, I'm not overly religious or anything, but I do, it's developed for me a faith in something bigger than us, a faith in life. And during those three months and still today, I kept telling myself everything happens for a reason. And at first I was angry and I was like, I don't, you know, this like yeah you do not want to hear that (laughs) I you don't you don't you don't want to hear it but I as something I always say as a person I kept telling myself you have to believe that something happened for a reason there's something bigger to this and it's so funny because that offer fell through completely oh and we ended up keeping the farm and renovating the, the farmhouse yeah but it was such I felt so relieved. I felt like, oh, my baby, you know, my baby's going to stay with me. And um, yeah, so it really mm-hmm. taught me, you know, even at my darkest moment to like have faith that everything does happen for a reason. You don't want to hear it. You don't, you don't. Mm-hmm. But eventually I started saying, yeah, it happened for a reason. Anyway, we can talk about the rest yeah. later, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's lovely. I, I would say I subscribe to that too. At the very beginning, I was like, no, don't, don't say that. Do not say that to me. I will rip your head off. Uh, But, um, but you will like, just a little bit of perspective has helped me see, see a little bit bigger picture, I think. Yeah. Um, Like you. Uh, Cedric has his weeping willow, which I think is so sweet. Like just how wonderful is that? Did you guys get the information back from the um, autopsy and genetic testing, I guess? Yeah. So we did get that back. Uh, but I had read somewhere on YouTube, well, read, I had seen on YouTube this fertility specialist because at that point I thought, okay, I'm dealing with repetitive miscarriage or repetitive loss. Like yeah. there's something off Something's here. going on. Yeah. So and the fertility specialist was like, you have better odds of having a live baby if you get pregnant within the three first cycles. Mm. And so I tried getting pregnant early, but like, you know, I had, I had to get dental work done and it ended up, I ended up getting pregnant on my third or fourth cycle that had come back. So, yeah. So six months or so, right. Because you didn't have a cycle for essentially three months. Yeah. Um, that was exactly. ovulating. Yeah. Okay. So I, I got pregnant. I feel like, yeah, it was September ish. Okay. And I didn't have answers, but I just thought, you know, I have better odds. I'm going to go. He looked fine. Like he looked like he didn't have a cleft lip. Um, he didn't, so, everything looked fine. So I went over and I did, I got pregnant. And then in November, 
I called the genetic department. I was like, well, I'm waiting. It was supposed to be six months. I want answers. And they were basically like, uh, work will call you back. And they ended up calling me back and saying that they did not find anything. They didn't know what had happened, um, that everything looked good. Okay. So, so yeah, so I was pregnant <laughs> with Jules at that time. And it was so traumatizing. Like, I really, I felt like I was scarred. Like, everything after that, being pregnant was high stress. Yeah. And I, I really struggled the first three months of pregnancy with Jules because I kept thinking, this fluke, this really rare thing has happened to me twice with the IUGR mm-hmm. and then with losing Cedric so late in my pregnancy. Well, I mean, so late. I mean, there's so many worse yes, no. stories. Yeah. I mean, like yes, this. but it's but, like beyond the first trimester when you think you're safe, you know, right? Like you're, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I went, so this person said, well, you need to, um, at five weeks, I remember the local nurse called me. She's like, you have to sign up Jules for daycare because we basically have this thing over here where we have daycare for $9 a day. It's like subsidized and, um, wow, but the waiting, yeah, yeah. Okay. But there's a yeah, waiting list. <laughs> yeah. There's a big wait list. So we, when you get pregnant, you sign your, your baby up right away. Yeah. Okay. But it's like, it's a really great system and actually other provinces are trying to copy us. Uh, yeah. So, um, basically, uh, I, broke down. I was like, well, I don't know if this pregnancy is viable. What if I miscarry again? I like didn't want to sign her up. Yeah. And then um, they were like, well, maybe you should go to a counseling group where other women are like having their rainbow babies. So I was like, <laughs> was sort of like, okay, so I go there. And there's two other ladies that had losses but they were very early, like mm-hmm. prior to seven weeks. Yeah. But there was this one other girl that had lost her baby. She had a stillbirth at 33 weeks. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it just really didn't help me. I just was like, You're you like, see, I'm... it could be worse. I could have lost it. I, I could lose Juliet at 40 weeks. You know, yeah. I just got so negative And I ended up going to like um, private counseling. Okay. And that really helped me but the the thing that helped me most and this sounds so crazy but so Chris Hemsworth did this like series called Limitless uh-huh. and um, the last episode was about death and having a death doula and how like when your time comes there just isn't much you can do about it except to go peacefully right And I don't know, it like really hit home for me. And I was just like, I can't, I can't change anything. I can't do anything. And like the counselor said, I have to look at the, I have to be positive. And from that day on, I was about, I was about 13, 14 weeks pregnant by then. I was just like, that's it. I was like, I can't do anything. Yeah. I can tell people about symptoms I'm having. I can advocate for myself, but I can't, I can't change, you know, odds of survival. There, there's just not much I can do, but I can be knowledgeable about what I'm living. And yeah. so I would read a lot of articles and try to understand. I had this, there's this pediatrician I follow on YouTube, um, Dr. Paul. Mm-hmm. And um, he was just like, when your kid is experiencing something, you can't expect the pediatrician to know everything because he can know a wide variety of things, but he can't be some specialist on this one condition, right? So you really have to listen to the parents because they're going to be really knowledgeable on that one condition because it's their kid and they're going to really research Get it. into it, yeah. And it, I just thought it was such great advice. And mm-hmm. I... If there are pediatricians listening, I think you should listen to that because not everybody uh, gives credit to the parents when their kids are sick. Yeah, because parents are like with them all the time. And you know when something's 
not right. Yeah. 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 And especially like with Annabelle, I had postpartum anxiety and Mm. I only heard about postpartum depression. Right. So when I was like something like 12 months afterwards, I realized I had postpartum anxiety and I went to see someone. It really helped me. But and I was like, I'm a very open person. Like I don't like I'm I'm very like straight and direct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I started finding that after being open about that, that people were like, well, you know, you have anxiety, you have anxiety. So, you know, whatever you say, we have to dial it down because you've got anxiety. So I had a lot of that Mm. in my pregnancy with Jules and, and I didn't because funny enough, when I stopped breastfeeding Annabelle, it's like my anxiety went away. And now that I had tools to know how to, you know, I knew I really had to prioritize my sleep and work out and eat right. Yeah. And all of those things together made me deal with um, anxious moments a lot yeah. better. And this time around, I didn't have depression. I didn't have anxiety or anything when I gave birth to Jules. It's been really good and in check. So, yeah. That's great. So Stephanie, I wanted to um, just make sure that uh, I covered everything that um, about Cedric and his birth and everything. So he was born. Can you remind us what date he was actually born? Because you. He was born on March 30th, 2022. Okay, wonderful. And um, did you guys, while you were in the hospital with him, and I know he was just so small, he was 63 grams. So, Mm -hmm. so, so small. And, um, really I'm sure very fragile. Like I'm sure his, his body was so fragile. Did you guys do anything in particular, um, with him or, um, were, did they, did the hospital offer any sort of support to help you guys make some memories with him while you were there? Yeah. I mean, they offered to take prints and everything, but he was just so small. We were just like, it's okay. And then They usually have this um, call photographer yeah. for stillbirths yeah. and they couldn't come that day. So I just quickly took my iPhone and my, that was a big, not disagreement, but like my husband was like, I don't want a picture. I was like, I don't want to remember this. this is the most horrible day of my life. Yeah. And um, I was just like, I want pictures. Okay. I might not want them right now. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I know that I'm gonna want to look back on them. And he just, he just really was a classical. I don't want to say classical. I don't think old men are like that. But it was a very like, you know, try to not speak about it. Yeah. As I'm so like trying to speak to everyone to like find comfort. Yeah. Well, so, and I think I, people deal with things differently, whether it's a man or a woman. I it's. It's surprising yeah. um, hearing all the people that I talk to and how they've they've managed to um, get through things and figure things out and and process things. So yeah, it's no fault of his for sure. It's just the way he he needed to com- compartmentalize that maybe to yeah. be able to move forward. So, yeah. um, and is there uh, anything else that you would like to share with us about Cedric and his? His little life, his short little life, but really precious to you. Well, let me think. Um, No, I don't think there is. It's just, you know, I really realized with all of this that it's a lot like when you lose, when you have a miscarriage or stillbirth, you have hopes, you have dreams of what could have been. And especially with Cedric in that short period of time, I had lost a lot in that year. Um, I'm, we, I have, uh, I had a few Grand Prix horses show jumping when I was younger and I traveled all over the world with them. And Mm -hmm. my one really good horse I had kept to retire and he passed away a year before I was really close to like, it's just my for me, my horse is like, yeah. and then my dog that had traveled all around the world with us, uh-huh. she passed away too. 
and and then Cedric and it just felt like I had a lot of loss a lot of grief and so weird but like I don't want I don't like I was not like psychotic okay like I was it was all there but sometimes I would turn my head quickly and I would think oh, it's my my dog Poppy's here and it wasn't it was just another dog and it was a little bit the same thing with Cedric sometimes would turn around I'd look at my husband I would be like oh, he could have been here with us and then I would I would have I had a friend that gave she had like the same due date as me oh she had her baby and every time I look at her baby I'm like that could have been Cedric Cedric could have been that age we could have done this that with him or even a few weeks ago we went for uh, Jules's passport and um I like really had a moment in the car like where I was like crying and like thinking it's something I never got to do with Cedric and never got got never got in passport yeah like yeah that's I I think that's the only thing really that is yeah. left to say yeah that the the hopes and dreams all the events you would be doing with them yeah. you just miss out on that that's and that is that is heartbreaking that is hard so yeah no, I just, yeah, I was traumatic. It was, um, I can't like, and to be honest, the only person I knew at the time was Chrissy Teigen that had gone through yeah. something similar. Yeah. And honestly, thank you. Like, I, I don't know if Chrissy Teigen watches this or not, but thank you so much. And like, I remember waiting in the ER and like, I had fear of not knowing what was going to happen. And I had found your podcast on, on YouTube and I was watching that and I'm going to sound totally faded here, but sometimes I was crying in your, like I was watching your podcast and it would make me cry, but at the same time it would feel so much better knowing that I wasn't yeah. alone yeah. through this. And <laughs> it, you know, it, often yeah. the babies are more like more close to term, which is even more heartbreaking but, but I, I, I felt like, like I'm not alone in this, right? Yeah. This yeah. women have survived this and I'm going to, I'm going to survive this as well. Yeah. Stephanie, I, you're, you're definitely not alone and we, we are so glad that you've found a community. I mean, it's a really terrible community to be a part of, but <laughs> if you, if you need to be a part of it, we're um, grateful that you were able to find some comfort in some of these women's stories. And so thank you so much for sharing Cedric with us today, because you're going to do something for others that um, hopefully they will find some joy and, and comfort and company and community in, in your um, story of Cedric. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.